Welcome to uh, another lecture in Inverse Problems. And uh, last week I showed you something about the Fourier transform. We defined the Fourier transform, we extended it to L2 and uh, already had some basic properties. And uh, now I will continue with some theorems which we will need. One of the most important theorems is um, Parseval's theorem. Oh, and um, rem uh, I want to remind you that, uh, of course, Forster is an excellent reference for this. And I'm just very terse here, very brief. Um, you will find more better and more proofs in his book. Okay, um, so let's turn to Parseval. There are actually two versions of this. So let me first prove the L1 version. So uh, let f and g in L1, so the Fourier transform exists. And then we have that uh, the integral of uh, f times Fourier transform of g is the same as the integral of Fourier transform of f times g. Um, first of all, does that at all exist? Well, let's look at uh, f hat of g times g of c. Now, um, f hat is bounded by the one norm of uh, f. That's something we proved. So um, this is smaller than a constant times g of psi. And so that means the whole thing is in L1 since g is in L1. And the same one for the, the same holds for this over here. Okay, um, so uh, it makes sense to compute this integral. We insert the definition and everything exists over here. So um, we can exchange the order of integration here using Fubini. And uh, we find that by taking this over, of course, uh, we get from f of x e to the minus ix psi. Uh, we get uh, f of x, uh, g of psi e to the minus i x i g, g of psi e to the minus i x psi d psi. So this is f of x, this is g hat of x, and uh, so this immediately holds. Okay, so um, that was easy. And um, now let f and g in L2. And um, I'm, let me make the remark that uh, I will always write uh, the Fourier transform of L2 functions also as such an integral, although that integral uh, might not exist. And that's always in the sense, like all, uh, also Forster uses this, it that um, this is the, uh, the rewrite the L2 function as a limit of L1 functions. And uh, then that integral converges uh, to of, um, a Fourier transform. And uh, um, so understand it as a limit of L1 functions if it doesn't exist. OK, um, so I claim that uh, the L2 scalar product of f hat and g is the same as the L2 scalar product product of f and g tilde. Does that make sense? Well, we already noted that uh, if f is in L2, f hat is in L2. So this product makes sense. And, um, uh, and, and here, of course, um, hat is the Fourier transform and tilde is the inverse Fourier transform. Uh, that implies that the Fourier transform, uh, that the scalar product of f hat and g hat is the same as the scalar product of f and g. And that also, of course, means that the norm of f hat is the same as the norm of f, simply by setting f uh, equals to g in the scalar product over here. And let me also prove uh, number two ex uh, immediately. Just set g equal to g hat here. Then uh, we have f hat and g hat scalar product is the same as f of g hat inverse g hat tilde, which is g. And so we get back over here. OK. Um, 
So uh, the only thing we have to prove is this one over here. And uh, well, the integral that shows up is exactly the one that we also had in L1. So the integral is the same. The only difference is uh, when we write down this L2 product, I can now no longer retreat to uh, real numbers because obviously e to the minus ix xi is always complex. And um, so the Fourier transform of a function will always be complex. And I cannot assume that uh, this is actually in, uh, a real L2, which I have over here. So uh, I will have to use G bar instead of G in the, uh, in the scalar product. And uh, you immediately see uh, what we have to do is compute the uh, Fourier transform of G bar at, um, at some value psi. Now, this is defined as the integral g bar of x e to the minus i x psi d psi. Now, extending the bar over here, we have to take uh, the um, uh, complex conjugate, <laughs> the complex conjugate of this one. So this is nothing but g tilde of psi, since the minus goes, uh, goes away, minus sign goes away, and then that's just the definition of the inverse Fourier transform. So that's uh, immediately the proof of number one and number two and three are already mentioned. Okay, now uh, let's look at the connection between the Fourier transform and the convolution. And let me quickly remind you, uh, we already proved uh, then we already used uh, the um, we already used the convolution and we defined it in the following way: f, let f and g l1 functions. Then the convolution of f and g at some point x is defined as the integral of, of f of y g of x minus y dy. And uh, we also prove we already proved that uh, f star g is in L1. So f star g is the convolution of f and g is in L1, and that its L1 norm is bounded by the product of the two single norms. Okay, um, I'm not sure whether I remarked it when I defined it, but uh, obviously um, the convolution commutes. So uh, f um, convolution with g is the same as the convolution of g with f. And another remark that will, it's, so it's absolutely trivial, but it will come in handy at some point. Um, if F and G have compact support, and uh, the ports, supports are uh, capital F and capital G uh, respectively, then the support of F, of the convolution of F and G is um, a subset of F plus G, where of course F plus G is defined as the sum of all elements in F and G. And that's, Immediately, immediately, right? I'm, uh, I'm not trying this. Okay, um, the most important thing for the convolution is the convolution theorem. And uh, this states that for f and g in L1, we have that uh, the Fourier transform of the convolution of f and g is given as two pi time um, ti a constant, let me say a constant times the Fourier transform of F times the Fourier transform of G. So in short words, the convolution, the Fourier transform of the convolution of F and G is the Fourier transform of F multiplied with the Fourier transform of G. And we have that annoying constant over here and uh, I already told you that engineers and sometimes also physicists define the Fourier transform a little bit different. And one of the main reasons is that if you do that, then uh, this factor over here vanishes. And uh, the convolution theorem is so often used that uh, this is really useful. Rather, you will see that I will always forget it. OK, um, so let's prove this. First of all, uh, we already know that uh, f convolution of f and g is in L1. So it makes sense to take the Fourier transform at some point psi. I write down the definition. I insert the definition of the convolution. That's exactly the one. And I write this, the x over here as y plus x minus y dy dx. Now, uh, same as above, all the integrals um, are um, um, exist. So I interchange the order of integration. 
I exchange the order of integration from, so go from dy dx to dx dy. By the way, this is always the trick when we want to prove anything uh, with this. So um, also for the radon transform, exchanging, just exchanging the, the order of integration is or very often the main idea behind the proof. Okay, if we do this here, then, um, and uh, um, take out the f of y e to the minus i psi y, which now does not depend on x, we have an integral over our n g of x minus y e to the minus i x a x minus y. Now, um, since we are um, uh, integrating over all of our n, um, we can exchange x by uh, x plus y, and um, we can replace x by x plus uh, x by x plus y so here we have a g of x e to the minus i x a x now and uh, of course the limits don't change we're still integrating over all of r n so uh, this is what we have here is almost g hat of xi um, only the uh, factor is missing so it's 2 pi to the n over 2 times g hat of xi what we have here now, what about the rest? Well, um, this really is f hat of xi, and it even has the constant over here. Okay, so all in all, we have that this is 2 pi um, to the n over 2, f hat of xi times g hat of xi. Okay, this is very important for us, and um, let me give you a very short example. Um, let uh, f on x the characteristic function of minus 1, 1. And remember that uh, we already computed the Fourier transform of that one. So uh, we should be able to compute the Fourier transform of that function convolved with itself uh, by using the convolution theorem. Okay, um, so let's first the uh, compute the convolution of f with itself. Um, so f star f is the integral over r f of y f of x minus y dy. Now um, f has its support in minus 1, 1. So uh, we can replace this by the integral minus 1, 1 f of x minus y dy. f of y is 1 in that interval. And uh, now we can observe when is this one and uh, when is it zero? When is it one? Well, uh, for it to be one, x minus y must be larger or equal than minus one, and x minus y must be smaller or equal to one. So um, inserting that, we get that this is the same as the integral maximum from of minus one and x minus one to minimum of one and x plus one over one dy. Okay, first of all, we see if uh, the absolute value of x is larger than 2, then this is 0. And this was clear from the beginning, right? Because um, this function f has a support in minus 1, 1. So from what I said about the support, we already know that the support of the convolution must be in minus 2, 2. Okay, good. So that's nice. Now, assume that uh, x is larger or equal to 0, then the minimum of 1 and x plus 1 will always be 1, and the maximum of minus 1 and x minus 1 uh, will be x minus 1, and you immediately see that then the value of that integral is 2 minus x, and uh, if x is smaller or equal to 0, uh, same thing, and of course, um, uh, absolute value smaller than 2. Um, then this is 2 plus x, and keeping this together, this means that this is nothing but 2 minus the absolute value of x for x, by absolute value of x smaller than 2, of course. Okay, um, let me write down that function. It looks roughly like this. So it's 0 outs outside of the interval minus 2, 2, so the support is minus 2, 2. And um, it uh, goes up to 2 at, uh, the, um, at, at x equals 0 and then falls again to 0. So uh, it looks exactly like this, right? And uh, in fact, we will 
it, it's for a reason that um, I'm computing this. Um, when computing the numerical approximations for the for, for the inversion of the radon transform, we'll use we'll reuse exactly this example. Okay, so uh, we have that function um, f with, um, um, convolution with itself. Now, what is the Fourier transform? That's simple now. Uh, due to the convolution theorem, we have that the uh, Fourier transform of that function is given by the Fourier transform of f times the Fourier transform of f. And probably you can guess why the square root of 2 pi is in the end and not at the beginning. I forgot it and had to add it later, right? So that will always happen. and. Um, Whenever you will be asking me, is there a constant missing, then usually the answer is yes. Okay, so, uh, but we already computed f, 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 f head of psi. It's square root of 2 over pi times the sink. So uh, this is 2 over pi sink of psi squared times square root of 2 pi. Okay, um, I always made a distinction here between L1 and L2. And um, definitely I would like to use the convolution theorem also for L2 functions, but it's not completely clear whether that convolution at all exists, right? Um, we haven't defined it. But um, you can see that this doesn't make too much of a problem. Uh, for example, for the convolution theorem, if f and g are in L2, we have that f hat and g hat are also in L2, which means that f hat times g hat is in L1. But if it's in L1, we can take the inverse Fourier transform. And um, if we believe in the convolution theorem, if we want the theorem of uh, convolution theorem to hold, we can define the convolution of f and g exactly as this right-hand side over here. So um, not only can we extend the Fourier transform to L2, but also we can extend the convolution to L2 in a continuous way. All of this is well defined. And so in, in, in future, I will not make too much difference between L1 and L2 functions. There won't be too much problems with that anyway, because we'll be using fast decaying functions or even functions with limited support. But, um, well, yeah, you'll see that um, this won't be too much of a problem. So I'm more or less, I'll be forgetting about which spaces the, uh, uh, the theorems were actually defined in. When recording this, I noticed that I forgot uh, one thing to mention one thing. Um, assume that uh, we have a function f in L1 and uh, assume that it's alpha times differentiable, alpha that uh, multi-index that we defined last time. Uh, and um, in that case, uh, we uh, the Fourier transform of d alpha f is well defined, and according to what we proved last time, this is the same as the absolute value of psi to the alpha. Uh, this is smaller or equal. This is the same. No, it's really the same as uh, absolute value of psi to the alpha times f hat of psi. Now. Um, um, that means that the absolute value of f hat of psi is smaller or equal to, well, d, d to the alpha f hat of psi, we can, uh, that's uh, bounded by the L1 norm of d to the alpha f, so that's a constant, times 1 over, uh, if I want to be exact, it's norm psi of alpha, and this is exactly, this is the same as, uh, So that means that the Fourier transform of a function that is alpha times differentiable, uh, that is n, let's, let's stick with 1D, is n times differentiable, falls with 1 over psi to the n. So uh, the more continued, the more smooth a function is, the more, the, the more often differentiable it is, the faster it decays at 
infinity. And that is something we already mentioned for Fourier coefficients. And uh, it's exactly the same thing here. And it's also exactly the same proof. And um, um, that gives rise to the comment uh, that uh, very often the rules and theorems for Fourier transform and uh, for the discrete Fourier trans for the Fourier series and the analytic Fourier transform are more or less the same. They uh, share a lot of properties and um, in some cases we will even without proof use properties which we proved for the analytic Fourier transform use for the uh, Fourier series of periodic functions. And uh, yeah, um, I think this is reasonable. The uh, proofs are always the same.